Hello and welcome to the worship service for the First United Methodist Church of Normal, Illinois. We're glad you're here to worship with us today. On this Father's Day weekend, we're going to be thinking some in the service about what it means to celebrate our fathers and what it means to be a father in this day and time as we think about how that relates to being followers of Jesus Christ. Let's worship God together.
Hi friends, I am Miss Pam, the children's director here at Normal First, and I wanted to come to you with a message today about the holiday that we have coming up where we celebrate dads. So let's take a minute to say thank you to all the dads out there and thank you to all of them for everything they do. Now friends, not all families look the same and that's perfectly okay. My family looks a little bit different than other families because part of my family was created through adoption. Can you think of families that look a little bit different? I wanna share with you today the story of a little penguin named Tango. You can read more about Tango's story in this book, Tango Makes Three. So Tango comes from a place called Central Park in the middle of New York City. And Tango didn't come from a traditional family. You see, her family was a little bit different too. Tango's parents, Roy and Silo, would watch all of the other families build their nests every spring. And then they would watch all of the other families' eggs hatch. But sadly, Roy and Tango never had any eggs that hatched. One day, they even found a rock to carry back to their nest. And they sat and sat and sat on that rock. But of course, it didn't hatch. But then one morning, the zookeepers found an egg that had been abandoned. And the zookeeper got an idea. I wonder, he thought, and he brought that egg to Roy in Silo's nest. And you guessed it, friends, that egg hatched because they took such great care of it. And that egg hatched into Tango. And if you were to visit the zoo, you could still see Tango and Roy and Silas swimming and playing with all of the other penguin families. Friends, we learned that families don't always look the same and that it's okay to be different and that families are less about who and more about what. And the what is having grown-ups that love and care about you each and every day. So let's pray. Dear God, bless all the fathers and all the grown-ups who step into that role with such love, dedication, and faithfulness that allow these children to grow and thrive. Please be with those who long to be fathers and those who've lost their fathers. God, thank you for loving us and giving us our amazing family. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, happy Father's Day weekend. I hope you are having a good weekend. I've been thinking some the last few days about what it means to be a father and what it means to be a father and a follower of Jesus Christ. I googled father figures and, and if you do this you get a link. One of the first links I got was to a website listing the best TV dads. So who do you think is on that list of the best TV dads? Well here are a few that were on the list. Homer Simpson, The Simpsons. Al Bundy from Married with Children, Andy Taylor from the uh, Andy Griffith Show, of course, Archie Bunker, Best TV Dads, Fred Sanford from Sanford and Son, Howard Cunningham, anybody remember Happy Days? 
Mike Brady from the Brady Bunch, Ward Cleaver from Leave it to Beaver, and some other dads that you might recognize, but I, I didn't recognize. So when you think about that list, what does that say about the way we portray dads on TV? Many of these men were kind of bumbling, weren't they? Uh, shallow characters. They were usually the butt, the, the, the butt of the jokes, the punchline. That's not how I think about my own father, though. I've been thinking about my father, who died two years ago, and I've been thinking about what were his strengths. What do I love and admire about him? What, what did he pass on to me? I've been thinking about my grandfathers. I've been thinking about my adult children. What is it that I hope I have passed on to them? Who do I want to be now as a father? What does it even mean to be a father these days? What kind of things should a father do? What kind of things do you think a father should care about? So I made a list of things that I think a father should do. See what you think about my list. First, I think a father should protect. Protect. Maybe this is a little old-fashioned of me, but it seems to me like the first job of every parent is to protect their family and to protect their children. To provide a, a place of safety and security, both physically but also emotionally so that children can thrive and grow. But who is my family? Who are my children? It reminds me of the question the lawyer asked Jesus. Remember, he, he goes to Jesus and, and says, uh, who do I have to love? Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Who do I have to love? As a Christian, I have special responsibilities for my immediate family, that's true. But don't I also have responsibilities for all of God's children? And especially for the vulnerable? You know, since our civil rights trip that we took as a church, we've been talking about the terrible and the sinful legacy that slavery has had here on our nation. According to our United Methodist Church and Society Agency, an estimated 40.3 million people today live in modern slavery around the world. Did you hear that? 40.3 million people living in slavery right now, today, not in the 1800s. That includes about 25 million who are in forced labor and another 15.4 million in forced marriages. So think about that. That's more than the population of Canada. So, so picture Canada in your mind and picture a whole nation made up of slaves, people enslaved by others, not free forced to, to do all kinds of things for someone else's profit or pleasure. Globally, forced labor and sex trafficking generates $150 billion in profits annually. 156 goods from 77 countries are currently identified as being produced by forced child labor. So we are benefiting from slavery by getting cheap products. You and I have slaves working for us in various industries around the world. How do you feel about that? According to the anti-slavery website, a conservative estimate is that over 12 million children around the world currently are enslaved. Some have been forced into back-breaking work in mines. Some are working with hot kilns making bricks. Some are in sweatshops making products for consumers like you and me. Some are cooking and cleaning in private homes, but not free. Other children are forced into marriage with older men, or into sexual exploitation, or forced to beg on street corners for their enslavers, or used to sell drugs or carry drugs. We often think of these forms of modern-day slavery as, as happening in poor countries around the world, in, in some place in Africa or, or the Middle East. But this is also happening in across wealthy countries in Europe, in England, here in the United States. And we know from evidence this is even happening in Bloomington Normal, in our communities. In 2007, Save the Children reported that 250,000 children live and work in Pakistani brick kilns. These, these are children who are put in complete isolation and forced all day long to make bricks. 250,000 children, that's, that's a lot more 
than the number of people that live in Bloomington Normal, right? That's, that's higher than the population of Orlando, Florida. Think about all those children. Every day, tens of thousands of children in India mine mica, which is the little sparklies in the makeup that many of our women here use. Slaves working for us. In the words of Jeremiah twenty two thirteen, 13, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbors work for nothing and does not give them their wages. In the words of Proverbs 31, 8 to 9, Speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out and judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Or in the words of our United Methodist Book of Resolution, we call on all United Methodists to actively champion anti-slavery efforts. Protecting the vulnerable, especially the children. That sounds to me like something a father should do. Working to set the captives free, that sounds to me like something a father should do. Our children have been telling us that they are afraid to go to school, that they're afraid that, that a gunman is going to come in and shoot them while they're at school. That seems like something a father should care about. Our children have been telling us that, that they're anxious, that they're having nightmares. In our nation, approximately 360 people in the United States are shot every day, 360 every day, and 109 of those people die from their injuries every day here in our nation. Though we tend to focus on on mass shootings, which happen every day now, actually mass shootings only account for about 1% of the firearm deaths each year. There's a lot of other things going on too. You probably know that gunshots are the number one cause of death in children now, overtaking car wrecks and other accidents and disease and illness. That sounds to me like something a father should care about. Whatever your politics are, whatever organizations you belong to, we should do something to respond to the needs and the cries of all of our children. In addition to Father's Day, I've also been thinking lately about Juneteenth. As I've become aware of this holiday in in the last few years, it's just been more meaningful to me as I reflect on it. As you probably remember, Juneteenth is a celebration of when the news of the end of slavery finally made its way to Texas and the last territory of slaves were emancipated. On June 19th, 1865, enslaved African Americans in Texas were told that they were free. In June 19, 1865, this was two months after the Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, Virginia. Gordon Granger, a Union general, arrived in Galveston, Texas, to inform the enslaved African Americans there of their freedom and that the Civil War had ended. General Granger's announcement put into effect the Emancipation Proclamation. And do you remember when, when that was announced? announced by Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. That's two and a half years earlier than these last slaves were freed in Texas. Every year I ask myself, why did it take two and a half years for the news of freedom to reach these slaves, these enslaved persons? I believe that Jesus Christ came to set everyone free. And yet I look around the world and I see so many people who are not living in freedom. The good news has not reached so many places in our world. The kingdom of God that Jesus came to usher in is not complete, not yet. We need more people committed to usher in this kingdom. We need more people committed to share the good news. And I think that's something that a father should do. Jesus came to help the blind see to restore sight to those who could not see. I think a a father should share a vision of how the world is supposed to be and what God wants and teach people how to see. We need more people who can see the world that Jesus is still working to bring to this earth. When I think of the best things my father did for me, I'm reminded that fathers are supposed to give unconditional love to their families our immediate families, 
and all of God's children that we can reach. Yes, we as fathers can have high expectations, but we have to make sure that our families understand our love and that this love is really unconditional. This matters to us more than if our kids are great athletes or great students, to love them for who they are, exactly who they are. Fathers, I would ask you, does your family know that you love them and that you will always love them no matter what? A good question for mothers too, everyone in the family. Our families should feel our love. Our families should feel our forgiveness. We have to overcome our pride and always be ready to reach out to forgive and to help our children overcome their mistakes. You know, another thing that fathers should do, fathers should be very intentional about passing on their values and their faith to their children. Of course, our children are going to make their own decisions, especially as they become adults. One of the ways we love our children, though, is to pass on all the wisdom and values and faith that we've experienced to be true. Too often, I'm afraid, fathers have, have abdicated their roles, have relied on their spouses or others to worry about spirituality and passing on values in the family. This is not what fathers are meant to do. Fathers are meant to be equal partners in sharing the faith. A father should care about passing on faith and values. A father should talk to their children and families about what they believe and what matters to them. A father should set an example of how to live, how to live out their values and their faith. The last thing I'll say for now is that a father should, share, should care about sharing equally with their partner. If a father is, is fortunate enough to have a partner in the family, the, the father should see that as an equal relationship. A father should always want to carry his share of the work when it comes to taking care of the house and taking care of the children. There is, of course, this outdated notion that the father is the head of the household. I want to say to you that I don't believe that that kind of way of thinking is God's will for us today. This is not the teaching of Jesus Christ, if you study him carefully. Jesus doesn't call for a hierarchy where, where there's a man who is the boss, who dominates everybody else in the family, where one person rules over. If you want to be great, what does Jesus say? You have to be willing to serve. Jesus gives a, a vision of a world where, where both partners, if there are two parents in the family, where both partners under God are equal. When we are ruled by God and the teachings and example of Jesus, what we want to offer is respect, not domination, not just rules. Jesus is about love. That's what a father should do, should love and share. So our relationships with our fathers and mothers is probably always going to be complicated, even if our fathers and mothers have been gone for many years now. Our parents have so much power in shaping us. When we come into the world, we depend on them so much. And our parents plant these voices in our heads that, that play back to us for years and years. On this Father's Day, maybe we can try to focus on the good things that our fathers and our mothers have given to us in spite of whatever imperfections are there. And for those of us who are fathers, let us recommit ourselves today to be the fathers that God calls us to be with Jesus Christ as our guide. May it be so. Amen. It is a privilege for me to be able to pray with you today as we think about what it is that we need to say to God and what it is that we need to hear to God. Let's join our prayers together. Let's pray. Almighty God of all creation, we join our voices to thank you today, giving thanks for your grace, for your loving care, and celebrating the joys of life that you have blessed us with, for family and friends, new relationships, 
and deeper relationships, new life and transform life, reconciliation and restoration. Today we thank you for those who have shown us kindness, for those who have shown us courage, for those who have shown us generosity, for those who have shown us truth, for those who have shown us compassion, for those who have shown us faith, for those who have shown us love. On this day, we are especially grateful for the gifts of fathers, the gifts of being a father, for fathers that we miss. We thank you for the many ways that our fathers have shaped us, for their example and their love. Yet we also pray today for those who have painful relationships with their fathers, those who are estranged from their fathers, and fathers who are estranged from their children. God, we pray for those who are unwilling or unable to accept the responsibilities of fatherhood, and we pray for their children. Gracious God, of all our prayers, we're, we're, we sum up all of our prayers and longing for your kingdom, that wonderful, amazing, and new reality that is emerging around us. May we be part of bringing it here. So we join our voices together, God, praying for the coming of your kingdom, using the words that Jesus teaches us as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We always want to take a minute to celebrate our offering, to think about the blessings that God gives to us, and to celebrate our ability to give back to God and to make a difference in the lives of others. Let's celebrate our offering now.
It is good to worship with you today in this way. We hope to see you soon. Hope that this will be a good weekend for you. Whatever ways that you celebrate, whoever you might celebrate with, as you think about Father's Day, as you think about Juneteenth, as you think about being a follower of Jesus Christ, may you experience God's love all around you. In Christ's name, amen.